for everything, Father. I give you glory for those that are here, Father God, that have woken up this morning, Father God, that have gotten up in their own power, Father, that they have transportation, they get dressed, things to dress, and Father God, things to eat, and Father God, a transportation to get in here, Father. I just thank you, Lord, right now. I pray for those that are not able to make it, Father, today because of the illnesses and because some of them, Father, they're, they're out of town, but for good reason, Father. We pray and bless our pastor and his wife as they enjoy their 29th anniversary today, Father God. Thank you, Lord. And also, Father God, we want to say, Lord, that touch the hearts of those today, that those who are listening, Father God, they can receive the word. Amen. Okay, I'm going to take my jacket because I already got a little hot there. Yes, okay. Well, you know, that's the devil. He, he's sneaky. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about today. I was reading an article about uh, well, Billy Graham. I, I think you all know Billy Graham. And it wasn't too long ago. He mentioned the intolerance of God as compared to the tolerance of mankind. Uh, tolerance is, is a word we hear all the time now, especially by intolerant people telling us we're intolerant. Okay? If you know what I mean. Okay? We're only tolerant when we agree with what they're saying. But then... If, they, if we don't agree, you're, uh, they, they do everything. We're intolerant. We're bigoted with everything. They throw the book at us. So we're silent. We are silent on a lot of times. And so as I was reading this article, you know, I said, yes, we are guilty of this. We are definitely guilty of this. He said, we, are ve we become very tolerant about divorce. I was reading... And I don't know how, you know, accurate these are, but these are statistics. Statistics, sometimes, depending on who you read them from, they bias whatever you want to prove, okay? But this one was saying roughly 60% here in California are divorced, 60%. That's over half, okay? Again, you can check it out. Uh, I'm not going to say, yes, 60, no. It could be a little less. It could be a little more. But roughly... 60%. It says, we have, out, we have outgrown each other. It says, we no longer, you know, this is the excuses we use for divorce. We are no longer understanding each other. We're not, you're not the person I married. I don't love you anymore. We're incompatible. And then we have the, for the unbelievers, of the, there's a no-fault no divorce. You don't have to have any reason. You just have to go, hey, you know, I want a divorce. That's a no-fault to go. And then for the Christian, we have one. It's called the divine guilt. Okay? How many have heard of divine guilt? Okay. Here's, here's what uh, James Dobson, he's a family child psychologist, married, married counselor. And he's, he ha used to have that focus on a family. I think you heard. Okay. He's been in the business of that for over 45 years. You know, he's pretty good. He's, this is what he said about the divine guilt. And it could be either spouse. He says, I prayed about this decision, and I am now certain that God approves of what I've chosen to do. Well, there you go, folks. If God approves it, hey, we can't argue with God. We can't argue. Well, that's one. We've become a tolerant about the use of alcohol. We drink because we're happy. We drink because we're sad. We drink because of a birth in the family. Uh, we drink because we found a job or, or because we lost our job. We drink because we passed a test. We drink because we failed a test. 
We drink because things went well or because things did not go well. We drink because we got a promotion or because we got a demotion. And I could go on and on. We drink for every reason, every reason. We become talented about delinquency. As a school teacher, I mean, there was people that were absent all the time. And I mean literally most all the time. There was one individual that comes to mind. Uh, he came in the first day of the second semester. You know, schools are broken out to semesters, four months of pre. He came in the first day, and he told me that he was coming back to school. I said, great for you. You're coming back. He said, yes. And then four months later, well actually three months and two weeks, he comes back again for the second time. And I said to him, wow. I says, uh, where have you been? He says, well, I have been sort of uh, fighting anxieties and everything else. But my dad has a, he, he's got the excuse. You know, he, I, I can, you, can, you, can, you can check that with your, I said, I can check that with your dad, but you still weren't here. Well, something, you know, transpired the next day. Uh, the principal came up to me and says, uh, EJ, she used to call me EJ. EJ, so-and-so wants to talk to you. The parents of so-and-so. I said, oh, wow, I know what he wants. He wants me to pass this child. Okay, so, yeah, he came over, but she didn't want to talk to him because she was afraid of this. He guy, this guy was an intimidator. I mean, he was an outspoken uh, activist for Fresno. And so he came up to me and said, Lord, help me. Give me the words. And so I asked him, I said, well, why has your son been absent? I believe him that, that yes, he had a valid reason he didn't come. He said, well, he's been overwhelmed. His anxiety is the whole bit. And he said, but I would like to see what he can do in two weeks to get past his class. I said, you know, sir, can I be honest with you? He said, sure. He said, you know, if he's been overwhelmed, and anxieties, and if this class would have been added to his anxiety over a period of three months and two weeks, if I put him through that two, uh, uh, a three and a half month course in two weeks, you might not have him anymore. I says, why don't we do this? Why don't we enroll him for summer school? Because I don't want to see your son any further damaged. I, I don't know if I will use the word in, uh, damage at that, but I said, you know, further overwhelmed. And he agreed. Oh, wow. Okay. And you know what? Uh, I got a call from the principal either the, the later on in the day or the next day, and she says, EJ, I don't know what you told that man, but that was great. I said, oh, Wow. I said, wow, I says, I didn't know what I told him either because the Lord was speaking for me because I tell you, he was an activist. Because, see, that's how kids learn when the parent makes excuses for the child. They learn they can get away with anything. Well, delinquencies, skipping school is no problem. Skipping work isn't either. It leads to that. When you become an adult, hey, you skip you know, especially on Fridays and Mondays. Fridays, you're in a hurry to get home, party up. Mondays, you can't make it because you party too hard. So we have a lot of substitute teachers on Fridays and Mondays. And I know that the same with all type of work, okay? So it's no problem when you're used to that. So, and we tolerate it. It gets worse. He says, we've become tolerant about wickedness in high places. We have elected non-godly people in government to represent us either by commission or omission. Let me tell you, some people just don't want to get out there and vote. Okay, they just don't want to get up and vote. Now, <clears throat> I was going to add a little bit to this, and I'm just not going to say much, because, but I'm not afraid 
to be up here in the pulpit and say something about politics. I don't want to say too much on it, but I wanted to read to you the platform for the Democrat. Okay, I'm not mentioning names, just the Democrat. Well, I don't think I have it with me, but let me see. Yes, I do. I'm just going to read part of the platform. I'm not going to ask you who to vote for. I'm not going to tell you nothing other than this is their platform. And this is just a part. It says, we blah, 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 good stuff. We strongly support legal protection for our immigrant neighbors. We believe in the full equality of women and LGBTQ individuals. No persons should ever be subjected to bullying, harassment, assault, or discrimination because of race, gender, or gender, I gender identity, sexual orientation, physical disability, economic status, or religion, and no person should live in fear of gun violence. Okay, it sounds pretty good, except for one thing in there, okay? Well, that's their platform. And if they're under that platform, let me tell you, they have to go by that. So no matter if that person is a good person, oh, but he's a good person. Well, if he was that good, he'd have to get out of the Democratic Party because otherwise he has to serve it under that platform. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say just that, okay? Because we do have wickedness in high places. And we don't go out there and vote. We need to vote. We need to go out there and tell them how we feel, okay? So we have a pr primary vote, I think, next month, the 3rd of March. Get out there and vote. Unfortunately, they're not going to have voting places where we can go. We're going to have voting centers. I think there's three in Clovis. You're going to get you're going to get this county voter information guide. I just want to give you some really fast, quick advice. I don't trust California. I'll be honest with you. Take your vote. Don't mail it in. Don't let somebody pick it up for you. Go to the one of those centers and drop it in there. Then it'll get there where it should be. Okay? That's my guidance advice for you. Take that because you're all going to get them by mail vote. Or, you know, by mail, you're going to get your ballot. Sign it. Uh, put down what you, who you're going to vote for, but don't mail it in. Take it to one of those voting centers. And it's, they're there. The address are there. Okay. We have become tolerant about immorality. You know, no rules we do. It says there's no rules. We do whatever feels good. If you were around in the 70s, some of you were probably around in the 50s and 60s, but in the 70s, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I am a generation of the 60s, okay? In the 60s, there, in the seven, early 70s, it was a saying, I would, I, would, I would contribute that to the 70s. It says there's a mo there was a moment, how many, it would say something like this. If it feels good, do it. There you go. You're from the 70s. Okay. That's what, it, that's what the, the motto was. You know, it doesn't re disregard what God says. If it feels good, do it. Okay. So that's how we are right now. We're, in, we're tolerant to immorality. Sexual immorality is running rampant. It's crazy. We become tolerant about crime. Very lenient on punishment now. Many states have outlawed capital punishment. And others, believe it or not, have decriminalized crime altogether as a way to save money. So they get to save money, and then they come out and they get to do more of their destruction on honest people. We become tolerant to godlessness. We're open to anything under the sun, regardless of what the God, our God says. Anything's open. They're, they're open to everything. 
we become tolerant to unbelief. We're less interested in God. And there's a thing you'll see on surveys or ballots. Or ballot. uh, it says, you know, they ask you uh, for identification part of yourself. It says, where are you? You know, are you Catholic? Are you this? Are you that? Are you Protestant? Uh, they got a nonce, you know. According to a recent analysis by political science, and I'm going to name him Ryan Burge, about 30% of Americans write in nuns as their preference, religious preference. Okay, that's a, that means that that person is affiliated with no religion. Absolutely. Now, keep in mind what First Timothy 4 1 says, in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith. I'm talking to Christians, believers here. But it also, it's rampant outside. If it's rampant outside, it's also, I mean, it also touches us. Now, so we're intolerant to all these things. Divorce, alcohol, delinquency, wicked and high places, immorality, crime, godlessness, unbelief. But can I say something to you? God is not tolerant to sin. Period. He's not tolerant to sin. You know, if Jesus had been born in this modern days, we just talked about Jesus on the cross. So Christians identify themselves by wearing a what? Uh, on, a, on, a, on a necklace, they probably, a cross, right? Okay. If he, if he was here today, what would we identify him with? Probably an electric chair, you know, hanging down our necks, or maybe a, 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 a drug injection needle, because those are the weapons of, in, of execution today, you know. But have you ever thought about that? If he came today, we're still just as bad as they were back then. We try to think, no, we're not as bad as we would have. Because he's so intolerant to sin, we would have killed him already. So, you know, we're not different. We're the same as the people that were before. Jesus said that many would find their way to destruction because of their disregard of sin. You know, in Matthew 7, 13, 14, Mona, a lot of you know this. It says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many will, fill, will, find, that, will find that way. He says, but narrow is the gate, and difficult is that way that leads to life. And few are there that find it. Think about it. That's Jesus speaking. Few are there that find it. But a lot of them, many, will find that way of destruction. Why? Because we disregard sin. Jesus said he knew the way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I didn't really get that really feeling of that until I thought about it. You see, with that little simple statement, just that, Jesus was telling everybody there, whoever was listening, and there was a lot of people. There were, there were people of all cultures there, believing in all kinds of gods. Yeah, there were Jews there, but there was all other people. And he was telling them, you know what? Your religion or whatever other beliefs you have is wrong because I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way. He says, I'm the way. He didn't say, I am the, I am a truth. No, he says, I am the truth. He didn't say, I'm a life. He says, I am the life. When he used those words, the, 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 he meant only through me. Only through me. There is no other way. So all those people... They were astounded. They were, some were surprised. But there is no other way. No other religion or no one else can save us. 
So he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Signifying by the word the, that he is the only way. There is no other way. Don't look for any other way. You know what? To us it seems simple. But sometimes we doubt. Because man, on the other hand, there's a scripture that reads in Psalms, I mean, Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it brings what? Death. That's right. Death. Because we think we have a way. Mike was just saying. No one else. Jesus is the one. When we proclaim him, we're saying, thank you, Jesus, for saving us because we were on our way to hell. People don't believe in hell. Well, that's too bad. It don't change things. You know, there is a hell. There is a heaven. Jesus was intolerant of hypocrisy. You know, he really let the Pharisees have it because they were given to outward piety, but inward sham. Matthew 23, 25 reads like this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Wow. That's the NJ, NK, the New King James Version. The New Life, I, I, I put it down here, New Life transi uh, Transition, it says, Translation. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious laws and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and not the dish, and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. He's telling that to the Pharisees and the scribes. In the same way, professing Christians today are only displaying an outward appearance. They come to church. They seem like, appear like faithful believers. But they continue in their own sinful nature. Paul nails it with this statement. He says, they have a form, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Wow. They just have a form of godliness. You can't tell from the outside. It, they look clean. But the inside... Their motives for doing anything, wow, filthy. The word filthy, I, I remember another scripture that I believe Isaiah used that, filthy rags. Filthy rags to me feels like, you know, like diapers, you know, when they're filthy. Oh, you, 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 you handle them like, like that. They're filthy rags. That's the way some of us are in the inside. So here's the thing. Here's the question. Are we counterfeit Christians? Are we counterfeit? Are we the real thing or are we counterfeit? And I forgot to bring in a coin I was going to use for this one. I could show you something, pass it around, and you probably say, this is the real thing. Or no, this is not the real thing. But you wouldn't be able to tell. I would pull probably... I would say pretty close to 99.9 .9 people, percent. And in your case, I probably fool everyone. Okay. Uh, you see, there's a there's someone said I heard said. Someone said this one time. He says there are two reasons. That people do not turn to Christ. I mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again because there's a lot of new faces here. One, they have never met a Christian. That's understandable. If you never met a Christian, well, you know what? Most likely, you're not going to turn to him on, a, on your own. You know, you just don't know about him. Okay? You, and you go on living. You might have seen reasons why you should believe in a God, but you don't. You let that go. If you never met a Christian, so you don't become a Christian. Okay? The other reason, that's the one that gets me. And it's, it's because they have met one. Wow. You haven't met one, and you meet one. 
What are you talking about, Pastor Rick? Well, I'm talking about people who seem to, you know, they, they seem to have, you know, uh, uh, be Christians, you know, but, you know, you can't, you know, you can't tell, you know, but they're not. They're not Christian at all. They just have that form of godliness, right? You met some of them before. You know, and it's pretty sad. Think about it. It's pretty sad that if I'm looking at you, let's say I'm looking at Emmanuel, and I say, and I look at him, I can't tell whether he's Christian or not. But if I hang around with Manuel a few days, a few weeks, maybe a few months, I should be able to distinguish him between an unbeliever and a believer. How do I do that? By his fruits, by his uh, language, by his actions, by his thoughts, all this stuff. Uh, it's pretty sad when we cannot distinguish one from an unbeliever. Ask yourself, if they looked at me, could someone tell me by how I act, what I say, what I think? Could they tell me? Could, could they say, you know what, you're different? Well, when we, how many of you were in the men's breakfast the other day? Raise your hand. Okay. You know, he alluded to that. Uh, our guest speaker, he said, you know, he was a Christian. And he went out fishing and a whole bit and camping with the people. And there, you know, wow. And he told them, I guess, how long I found out? He says, they said, you? You're a Christian? Wow. It made him feel this big. He said, you know what? It opened my eyes. It should open our eyes. If no one can distinguish us from an unbeliever. How many say amen to that? All right. Wow, it's getting serious in here. I'm going to throw a little bit. I'm going to say a little joke here or something. Yeah, you know, well, you know what? The reason I'm growing my mustache, okay, I don't know if you know, but the reason I'm growing my because I hate people reading my lips. Yeah. I want them to hear my words, not read my lips. They can't see my lip now. <laughs> oh, okay, Rose. I'm sorry, Rose. <laughs> so here, here's the question I have for you on that. If we are careful to take an honest look at ourselves, can we, can we say that someone should be able to distinguish us from an unbeliever? Ask that question. And if the answer comes back no, think about that. Meditate about that. Ask God for help, okay? Paul, Peter wrote it. I mean, he, he, you know, Peter was under the inspiration of God, of course. And he, and he put it this way, 2 Peter 2.22. I remember that because 2 Peter 2.22, 2, 2, okay? It says, a dog returns to his own vomit. And what? He says, and a sow, having been washed to her own wallowing in the mire. Man, go back to the muddy pond that they, muddy hole that they took her out or took it out of, you know, took that swine out. We shouldn't be like that. If we have been brought out, don't jump back. We have to hold on to all our godly attributes. That's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Self-control, we need to, I think, they, I think the Holy Spirit had it last because, you know, self-control is what we lack, a lot of us. Oh, we can be good sometimes. We can be, you know, hey, kind sometimes. We can be a little long-suffering. But, man, when we lose that self-control, we're out. So we need to practice that self-control. And there should be no exceptions whatsoever. I mean, yes, uh, me and my wife this morning, we had to apologize to each other. Why? Because, you know, there's moments, and I don't want to take the communion unworthily, and neither she, does she, and we knew that. But we need to practice that, being kind to one another, especially your spouse. He's your best friend. 
She's your part of your team. Man, I can't believe, you know, that I could play any type of sport if I'm against my own team members. I don't think I could win. In fact, it's, it's a plus on the other side. They would want me there. Uh, yes. So we shouldn't add anything. We shouldn't be adding anything or interpreting anything to God's word to fit our lifestyle. Because we're good at it, some of us. We're good at it. Man, you know, we're trying to get that guilt off, off of us, you know. Earlier this year, or this past year, I was listening to a, and I'll mention her name too. She calls herself a woman of God. Also, she refers to herself as one, you know. She's an author and speaker, Susan Cottrell. Have anybody heard that? Susan Cottrell? Okay, she, she was on uh, a guest speaker for TEDx Talks, YouTube, and I was listening to her. She's a founder of Free Hearts, a ministry for families of the LGBTQ. And she made a decision to choose her 20-year-old daughter, lesbian daughter, over the evan evangelical church. That's her, okay? It brought a standing ovation or a applause from the audience. Oh, man, they were clapping. They got up. They clapped and they clapped and they clapped. Wow. Yep. He says, her rationale, talking about Susan, was that God would understand because, after all, it was her daughter. And she, as a mother, had to protect her. Okay? Needless to say, her rationale made for a very sentimental issue. And they were crying. They were mad, plotting. Oh, man. I mean, they couldn't stop clapping. She's out there. Yep, I did the right thing, she says. You know. Besides, she thought, and this is what she said. What does the Bible say about homosexuality anyway? Wow. Has she not looked at scripture like Leviticus 20, 13? If a man lies with a male as he does with a woman, that's an abomination. Romans 1, 26, 27, last part of it, women exchanging the use of their natural use, you know, lesbianism. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. Hasn't she ever read those scriptures? What do you mean, the, what does God say about it? What does the Bible say? You know? She mentioned, yeah, she mentioned her daughter had called and said, Mom, you know, I guess after the confrontation and she was all right, she said, Mom, you know, I'm dating women now, and I feel more at peace with God than I ever before. Wow. Wow, the daughter felt more at peace with herself than ever, with God, than ever before. That's right, Emmanuel. Sounds to me it was the God of this world she was worshiping instead, you know. But it was all Susan needed to, to hear. It was all she needed to hear from her daughter to know that everything was well between herself and God. Hey, I'm well between Susan's obvious conclusion was that we had misunderstood God and the power of love. Wow. We misunderstood God. We misunderstood. See, we got, it. we got it all wrong. In fact, Moses got it all wrong when he wrote under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that homosexuality was an abomination. He said that in Leviticus 18.22 also. The apostle got it wrong when he wrote under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The sexual immorality referring to, referring to men lying with men and women exchanging their natural use for what is against nature, he got that wrong too. Paul also got it wrong when he wrote that this type of behavior would not be allowed, or uh, this, this, this type of, would not be allowed into the, in, to inherit the kingdom of God. See, he got it wrong, according to her. The sad thing is this, that many believers will ignore what God, uh, what Paul wrote, and instead believe the li lies of the devil and compromise with circular worldview. That's what. A lot of people believe that. I mean, she had a standing ovation. It looked 
by the YouTube, it looked like there was thousands of people there. They were all clapping, right? Well, that's false teaching, right? That's false teaching. And just the, this is just the, the false teaching we have today. Love, 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 but without truth. truth. Man, that's cheap love. That's cheap praise. It's another example of fake news. And I call it fake news because the more we hear a lie, the more people believe it. That's the idea of putting out fake news today. You know, if you put it out long enough, more people hearing it, it becomes almost like, well, it must be the truth, you know. Well, it hasn't been, you know, fake news has been along or has been around for a long, long time. It's been a long time. We say, well, that, that just started with so and so. President Trump and he made no President Trump didn't start that. Two thousand years ago, the Pharisees, when they first were told that Jesus had resurrected, said to the soldiers who were supposedly guarding the tomb. You know, when they, when he had resurrected, they saw him. They went to the soldiers and said, "Tell them his disciples came at night and stole them away while we slept." Wow, that's fake news, right? <laughs> yeah. And you know what? 2,000 years later, there's people that still believe that. They don't believe Christ resurrected. They stole his body. How's that for good fake news? If there's such a term as good fake news, okay? For them, it's good. For us, we know it's not true. It's fake. Okay, so summarizing, I'm going to get off, off on Susan already. And, but just the last thing Summarizing on Susan and her lesbian daughter, I am quite sure that rather neither the mother nor the daughter were listening to the God of the Bible. That's the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, that's, I can be sure of that. Because the Bible tells me different. You see, God is unchanging. So Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change because our lifestyle is changing, because our culture is changing. No, he stays put. We must adhere to his word and stop changing it. That's what we need to do. We must stop giving his word an interpretation to please ourselves, our relatives, our friends, or the times. It was Jesus who said this. Think about that. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Sometimes those things are hard to understand. But what it really means is that, you know, God has to come first. If your son and daughter are doing something and you just approve of their actions, you're just taking their side. You left God already. It doesn't say you hate that person. No, you love your son. You love your daughter. You love your wife. You just want them to do what's right. You wouldn't let someone who is going to hell go to hell. You tell them, hey, because you want them to know the what? The love or the truth. You want them to know the truth. Okay, so the bottom line, you know, the Bible says, that we ought to abstain from evil form, from any evil form. Or all, another translation, all appearance of evil. You have to abstain. So the question is, if we are to abstain, should we much less be participating in it? If I can't even appear to do something new, it, I know that I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't participate on that one. So the bottom line to all this is beware of false teachers in the last days. The tolerance for all that mentioned, you know, the tolerance for all that I mentioned can be attributed to false teaching and to the lack of fear of God. That's where it is. We lack fear of God. You know, some people are afraid to speak up because they're afraid to can't judge that person. Do we look the other way when we see other believers doing what they should not be doing? Okay. Are we not held back 
because of that scripture that tells us that we should not judge or we ourselves be judged. Oh, I better not say anything because then I'll be judged, right? That's what we feel. Uh, are we hesitant to speak out because we're afraid to be told by the wrongdoer that we should not be judging him or her? If you think about those questions, a lot of times we say, yeah, you know what? I didn't say nothing. I should have said it, but I didn't say it because we're afraid that they'll come back. You shouldn't be judging me. And you know what? We're talking about a person judging a believer, not an unbeliever, because the unbeliever, guess what? God's going to judge them. We're not supposed to be judging them. It's the believer who's in here who is professing to be a Christian, but he's walking the opposite direction. Heaven, hell. He thinks he's walking to heaven. Shouldn't you stop them? Hey, you, you're walking the wrong way. You tell them in love with the truth. You can't say, oh, yeah, well, you know. No. Stop them. Don't be afraid. God's not going to judge you because you told a person in truth that, hey, he's going the wrong way. And the apostle, he said this, that we must judge those who are inside. That's referring to the brethren in Christ. And yes, Jesus himself said, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. See, we can judge with righteous judgment, but we don't do it by appearance. I don't like the way the guy dresses. He must be one of those, you know, he's judging it. No, you can't do that. You can't judge. My wife has this favorite thing, and I believe her. I mean, you know, I know that sometimes she thinks I'm not listening, but my wife says this. You cannot say that about that person because you don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know what's going on. They might say something bad to you, you know. Wow, well, that surprised you, especially coming from that person. But you know what? You don't know what's happening in their lives. So you got to have a little mercy, a little grace. Okay. <clears throat> And again, don't worry about the outsiders. Don't judge them. God's going to handle them. Okay, so don't don't out there. Hey, I'm going to judge. Them. Oh yeah, you know what? Hey, let them do what they want to do. Tell them the word. Tell them the truth. But don't judge them. Let God do the judging. Okay, are we keeping God's commandment to love one another? Okay, Jesus' commandment to love with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Remember the, the other day, the pastor preached a pretty good uh, sermon on who's our neighbor are, you know. We uh, ought to look at ourselves. Who are we? Uh, do we show grace to others when they have offended us or perhaps they have done something that does not agree with us? Do we easily get angered with their actions? Our character should be one of total control over our thoughts, our expressions, our attitudes, our interests, our actions, and the way we personally look at life. That's, that's our character. We should have control. We should, see, we should have a character that's pleasing to God. Don't try to please people. We're full of pleasers right now. That's what's wrong with this politics stuff. They're pleasing man instead of pleasing God. They want to get voted. They'll, they'll, they'll do anything to get your vote. Yeah. But, you know, God says, what, if it, what would it profit you, right, if you gained the whole world, lost your soul? Man, eternity is a long, long time. If you live to be a zillion years, which I know zillion is not a number, okay? It's just a way of saying like a big, unmanned, you know what? That's nothing compared to eternity because eternity never ends. <clears throat> so I ask myself, why are people becoming so tolerant of everything? Why are they becoming so tolerant? Well, I believe, again, I'm using the word I because, again, I am no theologian. I am not schooling this stuff. Check it out. See well, how you feel. See how you, what you read. 
But I believe the reason is many have lost the fear of God. That lost fear of God. I mean, when you lose the fear of God, think about it. You can do everything without even thinking about you doing anything. It doesn't, you don't, it doesn't matter whether you do something good or you do something bad. You just don't care. That's the fear of God. Lost the fear of God. Proverbs 3, 7 reads like this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes because you're going to get it wrong. It says, fear the Lord and depart from the evil. Many are leaving the way of God for our worldly ways. Many. Some call this trend. There's a trend. It's called cultural liberalism. Okay? Cultural liberalism tends to be very permissive when it comes to very controversial issues, mainly abortion and sexuality. Man, those two issues are, man, you can, they're going to get votes on those depending on how they sway you. Read your Bible. Put on that armor of God and then vote appropriately. That's all the guidance you need to know that you will do the right thing. Read your Bible. Find out who these people are. They are saying what? They vote appropriately. And God, God's going to tell you. Uh, because even, the do- because even the, those that claim to be Christian, you know, there's a lot of Christian, uh, people out there that are Christian. Yeah, they're Christian. Wow. There's an article with Pete Batten, Burr, or someone, I forget his name, last name. He's a Christian, supposedly. Wow. If that's a Christian, boy, I'm no different. Uh, the unbeliever is no different than him. Uh, he's running for president. I think he's still in, in the run. Pete uh, Betten, Burr, whatever. What's his name? Okay, Bernie Jay, something like that. I don't remember because I'm not going to vote for him. Okay. He's not my Christian type. Okay. Okay. Uh, So even those that claim to be Christians, you know, they're caught in this web and somehow justify their ungodly behavior. I say caught in a web because Paul, again, the reason God, Paul said so many things just the right way was because he was being moved by the Holy Spirit. He was being revealed all the things that Jesus wanted him to say. Now, if Jesus is telling you what to say, if teachers is, if Jesus is your personal teacher, how can you go wrong? So he had everything right. He he had this to say. He says, and they and that they, referring to the believers and unbelievers alike, may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. In other words. You have been taken captive by him to do his will. In other words, you don't even know that you're doing his will. You think you're serving the Lord and you're doing his will. You're caught in a web. Spiders set up webs as traps to snare their prey. You know a spider, right? Nice, big, beautiful webs. Man, they catch that fly coming in and the the, the web just kind of moves a little bit. And that spider, she feels that sense. Man, she's out there in a second, man. She wraps that thing and she's got her meal. Wow. I, 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 one, I once saw a spider, uh, a garden spider, beautiful little yellow black garden spider in my backyard in Kansas City. I used to watch, no, uh, North Carolina. I used to watch it every day. And I saw it get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Wow, she was beautiful. And then she had babies herself. Wow. It's just amazing how that the spider, she sp- spread out that web, beautiful web. And every day she'd catch her share of food. And so, you know, spiders, that's what they're supposed to do. But see, sometimes we act like spiders. And we set up ra- uh, webs to trap, snare you know, our prey. 
We might not be all spiders, but some of us sure act like them. We might not be all flies, but some of us fall into webs just like them. You know, King Saul, I use it uh, 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 about snaring. King Saul, uh, even King Saul used his daughter Michelle, hoping she would be a snare for King, or was to be King David. She used, he used his daughter, mind you, to try to snare David. And, that the, and, the, and so that the Philippines would, Philistines, excuse me, would be against him and kill David. You see, he didn't ask for any diary or anything like that. What he asked was, I want 104 skins from the Philistines. Okay. What was he planning? He was planning that he get those Philistines angry at him and kill them. He wanted to snare him. But God was with David. So he got the 104 skins and he got the wife, uh, daughter too. But that wasn't. Saul's purpose, Saul's purpose was to use his daughter as a snare. Think about the wickedness of a king like that. Can you use your daughter to snare somebody? Wow. Okay. Well, in the same way, the devil sets up traps to snare the careless, and they have to, and then have them do his will without them even realizing that they're doing his work. That's the work of the devil. This is the trending, be the trending belief among Christians today this, that even if one is sinning, here's, here's how, what they believe. Even if one is sinning against God, that God is merciful. You know, oh, God is very merciful, and he's gracious, and he's forever loving, and will forever forgive us regardless. Even if we go back to our own life. Again, Mike was saying that. That's why I knew I got to say it because the Lord used Mike to incite me in doing a message. I was going to give you my testimony, personal testimony. Been here a little longer, but because I got a long testimony. Okay. Because uh, I got an ugly life behind me, too. So, you know, when you think that way, that God will forgive you. Man, you're, you're free to do anything then. Hey, yeah, I, I'm going to get forgiveness. When I was a Catholic, the thing was with kids around my age, let's go in there and confess three bad things. We only done one, but, but the, the, the father would say, well, I'll, okay, I'll forgive you those three. Well, see, I got already two already forgiven, so I can do two things free. See, that's what I thought. That's what we thought. Ask for three forgivenesses, but you only actually done one, but you got two. Like, I hit spared, you know. Well, that doesn't work that way with God. We cannot mock God, okay? We cannot mock God. So when we're out there doing outreaches, especially when we were doing the homeless, you know, me and Pastor Charlie, uh, be, you know, they were doing other things. They were singing music and doing testimonies. Charlie, Pastor Charlie was out there one and one. I was out there one and one. He went outside the street. I was on the other side of the street. And we used to ask people, you know, hey, how come you're out here? Or we would ask, I mean, just be point blank on them, you know. Uh, and sometimes they would answer honestly, well, yeah, but, but, but I'm only human, they said. Or they claim. Well, that's the reason, because we're only human. That's the reason we all, we're all sinners. And that's the very reason we all need God in our lives. Because we need him to, we need our life, we, we need to give, God, need God in our lives to repent, right? And to ask forgiveness and in turn receive Jesus in our lives. That's the reason, because we're human. If we were not human, we wouldn't need Jesus. But we're human and we're sinners. The Bible says we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. All of us. Everybody say all. Oh, not one here that can say, I'm not a sinner. Because if you say you're not a sinner, you're a liar. That's what the Bible says. Because you, see, when you say I'm not a sinner, you're making God a liar. So if I have, a, if I have to make a decision, God a liar, you a liar. Manuel, a liar, God a liar. Who's a liar? 
Yeah, Emmanuel's a liar, okay? Rick the liar, God a liar. Who's a liar? That's right. Rick the liar. We can say that with everybody. God does not lie, okay? So we need Jesus in our lives because no one is good, not even one, he says. Not even one. And you can find that in several places. Psalms 14, 3, uh, Psalms 53, 3, Matthew 19, 17, Mark 10 and 18. There's not one, not even one. We're all sinners. No one is good except God. So without Jesus in us, we can do nothing. Jesus himself said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruits. For without me, you can do nothing. So if you ever see a person who's a Christian, he says he's a Christian, but he has no fruits, guess what? Who's lying? <laughs> no fruits. If you have no, what do you do with, with, a, with a beautiful lemon tree or, well, maybe you don't like lemons, maybe a peach tree. You plant it and grows up to be a beautiful tree and you wait for the first crop, no, no, no peaches. Okay, so you wait the next year, no peaches. You wait for another year, no peaches. What do you do with that tree? You cut it out. Cut it. Plant another tree because that tree is fruitless. And if a tree is fruitless, he's worthless. It's worthless. Man, you put it out because you wanted fruit. That's not producing any fruit. Well, that's what's going to happen to fruitless people. The Bible says he's going to cut those branches off and he's going to throw them in the fire. Okay. We need Jesus. We need to be part of that vine. And losing the fear of God, but losing the fear of God, it's coming on, it's come on us gradually. Okay. And not, and not something just happened yesterday, say last year. It came upon us gradually. So we are being led to believe that God is all loving by a cheap grace doctrine. False teachers use scriptures and then benefit their doctrine. You have to listen to these. They're very slick, these people. They, they use scripture like 103.8. Let me read to you what 103.8 says. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Oh, sounds good. Romans 8, 38, 39 says this, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, that sounds, that sounds great. Yes, God is all that. He's all that. He's loving. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. But what about these scriptures? Psalm 50, Psalms 5, 5 and 6. I took it off the New Living Translation because that's the one I memorized. It says, the ar arrogant cannot stand in your prison. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. Bloodthirsty and deceitful man, the Lord abhors. He hates them with a passion. What about that one? They never read that one? Maybe not. I do not know. But they, start, they, start, gotta, they have to start reading the full Bible, not just the parts that fit their doctrine. Because if you look at a God that's merciful, grace is always abounding in love, he's going to forgive you all the time. Man, hey, I can do anything. I can go back to my old, my old mud puddle. I can go back to my old life and do whatever I was before. If I was a criminal, a rapist, whatever, hey, I raised up my hand already once. I got my ticket and put it right there. I got my, trip, my, my, my ticket to heaven reserved, and I'm doing what the world does. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm walking to hell thinking, hey, when I die there, in my funeral, somebody's going to say, wow, he was a man of God. He died. He's in heaven, you know. Uh, what is that? Uh, rest in peace. Wow. I've never been to a funeral yet, and I've been to a lot of funerals in 73 years. That I remember, maybe 70 that I remember. Maybe before that, I didn't know. No, no, excuse me, 65. Okay. Uh, not one of them went to hell. 
Not one of those people that died went to hell. Yet Jesus said, man, many will find it. So what's happening? Who's lying? I think man's lying. Hey, we cannot go back to our own lifestyle. We can have it. We think we have it better. Oh, we gain this and we gain that and the whole bit. But if you gain the whole world, like I said earlier, what would it profit you if you're going to lose your life? No, it doesn't. Now, you know, we have to thank God that sometimes he must take, he must, by necessity, because he's a good God, he must take drastic measures to keep us from, some of us from suddenly being destroyed. Okay? We might, we might not like the circumstances we're standing in, but we must remember that God is in control. And he has us exactly where he knows is best for us. Man, we can be in a place where, man, this job is killing me. Man, this, this, all these unbelievers are all over the place, man. I have, can't stand a chance. Hey, God's got you there for a reason so that you can tell him about the truth, about the love of Christ and what he did for us. You know, wow, where are they going to find it from? Other unbelievers? No, that's why God's got you there. Hey, suffer a little bit for God's sakes, not for your own sakes. That don't get you no points if we're looking for points, okay? Okay. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's a quote. Jamie Dean, uh, she's a contributor to World Magazine. Now, how many are you familiar with World Magazine? Any show of hands? Rose Matt? You know, I wasn't familiar, you know, until the pastor started giving. He gave me one. Now I can't wait for him to give me another one, another one. I, man, give me all those world magazines. And he, he, I keep a lot of them. Of course, I have to get rid of them some because they're, they're accumulating. And, and we haven't got any room. But they have great articles. Great articles. And, you know, I, I stopped reading a lot of the newspapers. I, I don't trust the New York Times. I don't even want to look at the Washington Post. I don't even want to look at the Fresno Bee because it's full of hypocrisy. It's full of lies. It's full of fake news. It's full of everything. The only thing that it has is for people. If you know that, that you know, people say, well, I like that Fresno Bee. Man, you can almost tell, man, that, that guy's an unbeliever. That's what I feel. That's my feeling, okay? But, uh, it's crazy. I told my wife, get rid of that thing. Tell them it's become too liberal for me. I can't handle it anymore. I'm being overwhelmed. Anyway, World Magazine, coming back to this nice quote. Listen to the words, beautifully spoken. He says, right now, we live in a world that looks at issues of being transgender as a gold star. In the eyes of other teens. But. To be heterosexual. To be comfortable. With the gender you were assigned at birth. And to be non-minority. Places you. In the most. Evil. Of categories. With teens. Identifying themselves. With the culture of transgenderism. So if you're homosexual, if you're a lesbian, if you're a transgender, man, you have a gold star on you. They look up to you. Wow. That's what is happening to our teens today. But if you're normal, heterosexual, man, you are in the evil category. Man, they will bully you, electronically bully you. And they can't electronic bully me. I don't, use, I don't go on Facebook, I'll tell you that much. I don't go on anything. I mean, people complain, well, this is, they're bullying me. Well, yeah, you put yourself on Facebook. Yeah. Gee. It's like a, I used to tell my wife. Well, maybe she, she's leaving now. But she, 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 she used to go to the bathroom. And she would invite five or six other women with her. And then she'd go. And then she'd come back half an hour later and say, oh, the, the bathroom was too full. I said, yeah, you took the whole crowd with you. Of course it's going to be full. Okay. 
But anyway, that's what's happening. Hey. It, when I read that, I said, man, she's got it down to a, I mean, right on the nail, man. When you being heterosexual, you're the abnormal one. You're the one that's not popular anymore. But if you're everything else but normal, man, you got a gold star. Man, they look up to you. They cater on you. They, oh, they try to ruin. Man, they, 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 okay. And then there's another lady, co another contributor to World Magazine, Andrea Sue Peterson. This is what she says. What a tangled web we weaved when we make our aim in life to be modern rather than to think for ourselves. Wow. We can't think for ourselves anymore. Uh, the other day, I, we listened to a three-part message, or three messages, two messages from the Jehovah Witnesses and Pastor Charlie. These people don't think for themselves. And we're saying, there, wow, wow, you know, man, they, why don't they think for themselves? Well, you know what? They can't think for themselves because they got this governing board, you know, that does their thinking. Well, sometimes some of us act that way. We don't think for ourselves. We don't say, hey, you know what? No, that's not right. I'm not going to do it that way. God has instilled in us right from wrong, good from evil. We ought to know, you know. Thank God that he put that in me. He, he wrote it in my heart, mind you. I'm not going to give that up. You know, I'm going to do what's right to the best of my ability with God's help. I don't want to be in the world. So more and more people are acting like minions, doing whatever they see others do. You know what a minion is? Have, have you know what a minion is? I see minions. If anybody see Despicable Me, okay, and they got Despicable Me 2, Despicable Me 3, and then they got now minions by themselves. They broke out, okay? But these people, these minions, they do whatever somebody else is doing. They're followers. Man, they, they're the leaders. They're follow, okay? So the current trend on that one is that, hey, everyone else is doing it, so it must be all right. Wow, we can't do that. Just because you see your friends doing it, just because you see others doing it, just because you see the, the whole class, and if you're in a class, the whole class is doing it. Think for yourself. Is that in accordance with God's law? If it's not, then guess what? The whole class is wrong except you. Okay? If the whole world said this was right and God said it's wrong, it's wrong. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't need a majority. One is a majority for him. The big one. That's, that's the majority. <sighs> it says we are desperate. We are in desperate need of God's help to ward off all the ungodliness that surrounds us. Wow. We're in desperate need of God's help. Wow. If any other time in this life, of ours. If any time we need God, it's now. Think about your children that are going to school. You say, well, she's in, he, she's, you know, he, she's in college. Hey, college right now are the worst places that you can get indoctrinated into the ways of the world. These people are wow, wicked. They're aggressive. If you dare to tell them anything, man, they, you know, man, they intimidate you by their degree, by their voice, by, you know, standing over you, by, by mocking you, you know, making you feel like you're the only one. Let me tell you, if you're the only one, suffer for Christ's sakes for a little bit because God's going to take care of us. We're not going to face the wrath of God. So we need to have God's written word in our hearts that we might not sin against him. Psalms 119.11. We've got to have that word in us. Because when we have it in us, we feel it. We feel it with a godly way, in a godly way. You know, 
we know it's not right in God's eyes, and we won't do it. Even if we're found by ourselves, isolation is a terrible thing. This is when many people, will, if they're going to sin, they're going to sin when they're isolated from everybody else. That's why you as a Christian should always come to church to be encouraged by others, especially when you see the time is approaching. That end time, man, we're going to see all kinds of stuff. I need my brothers and I need my sisters helping me, encouraging me up. Because if I'm alone, I'm like a sheep without a shepherd. I will be lost. I cannot be independent. So no, God is not tolerant. Coming to a close here. God is not tolerant. We need to be intolerant to sin, just as Jesus was. Let us not wander away from his commandments. Psalms 119.9. Let us pray. Father, help us not to wander away from your commandments and keep us under your discipline. It might hurt us somewhat, but it is good for us because only you know the way in which we should walk. Only you can fill us up with the Holy Spirit that we can help us, that you can help us from falling into temptations by giving us a way out. Only you can keep us from making our life or our aim in life to be, mo to be modern rather than to think for ourselves. Only you can help us to be intolerant to sin and not compromise our core beliefs with the ungodly circular world view. And only you can teach us to pray and worry about nothing, but, by, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and to let our requests be made known unto you. We serve an, an almighty God who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Thank you. All right.